lecture. Good evening. Today is with us uh, Mark Fisher from London. Uh, he's probably the most uh, known for his book also translated in Croatian, Capitalist Realism, and also for his famous blog, Kate Punk. Uh, this is the second lecture this year in our series in the Center for Drama Art, the Methodologies of Polarization. Uh, there will be two more lectures tomorrow by Owen Hedley and Douglas Murphy, and also three more in December. Uh, Mark will talk, will talk about the, the political aesthetics of uh, post-capitalism. We'll talk for, let's say, 40 minutes, and then after his talk you can ask questions first. So Mark, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming, everybody. Okay, I'm going to start with a clip um, from a BBC television program, Have I Got News For You? It's a kind of slightly irritating um, satirical news program. Um, but uh, this uh, was an exchange with the uh, even more irritating, including even more irritating, um, chick lit author turned um, Tory MP uh, Louise Mensch. Um, uh, and it was an exchange about the um, Occupy London um, stock exchange. Uh, and I think. It, it's kind of symptomatically interesting, and sort of lead into the, lead into the kind of topic that I want to deal with today. Okay, so about four minutes, um, maybe won't watch it all, but just to get the gist of it. You don't want to hear about that happen, have you? Um, that's another whole miserable aspect of Britain, which you can leave aside for the moment. Okay, now, um, well, it's sort of what interests me about that really is um, can we so easily dismiss um, Louise Mensch's point here? Or rather, why does it seem to make sense when Louise Mensch says, uh, well, anti capitalists, um, how, can they have, how can they be on Twitter? How can they be having iPhones? How can they be, uh, you know, how can they be in um, um, Starbucks? So being in Starbucks seems to make more sense. Although at the end, uh, I, I want to move around and say, uh, even the design of Starbucks is, is, is nothing to do with the design of capitalism, actually. Um, but but why, why an attack on iPhones, as it were? Why, why, why does that seem to make sense? Why does the, why, why is, why is, why is anti-capitalism been associated with this um, kind of uh, anarcho primitivism really? Um, now, of course, you know, as we, as we thought, saw there, she was ridiculed. Um, but, I mean, this kind of critique that she's making there, um, it just wouldn't have made much sense, I don't think, in the, in the time of the Cold War, let's say. Um, you know, this, this association of um, um, sort of anti-capitalism or, or opposition to capitalism with anti-technology. Um, that, that you know, but at the time of the Cold War, the space race, etc. Um, you know, that, that that association wasn't made. Um, so something to do with, at, at least at, at least on the implicit and, and perhaps disavowed level, of political aesthetics of of, um, of anti-capitalism, which implies, which, which at least implies this this um, this opposition to, to kind of technology and to modernity. And, 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 and I want to suggest that is really a serious, a serious problem, actually. Um, and that you know that what Mensch is, uh, is saying is maybe what a lot of other people think, um, and uh, and maybe why a lot of other people, um, and I think particularly working class people, um, you know, ha have problems with anti-capitalism. So even even if they may um, support um, a lot of the aims of anti-capitalism, um, you know, even though. The, you know, for instance, the, 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 the share the anger against banks, um, but nevertheless there's a certain reticence in, um, in, in being associated with anti-capitalism. And, and that's because um, you know, of, of this idea, I think. it's partly because of this idea, that, that being anti-capitalist means you'll have to um, you know, re revert to a barter system, you know, be living in a tent, um, 
uh, be reduced to face-to-face -face interaction, you know, grow sort of rotting organic vegetables and all of that, and that is what, that's what life will be. In other words, you have to repudiate, um, just to throw your mobile phones away at the door and abandon all hope, you know, that, of ever getting them back. And, and, and I really think that um, it's, it's really important that we articulate um, an, an opposition to this. And start, and start to really say, well, what does what does post capitalism what does post capitalism involve actually, um, and and I think that might partly involve in a shift away from anti capitalism and 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 associations of of anti capitalism um, to, towards towards this concept of, of post capitalism, um, with, and, and, and I think this is partly about reasserting that uh, in lots of ways a kind of a traditional Marxism. In a way, with, with its idea of, of, of technocracy, um, of you know maximising um, productive potential, um, of, of planning, um, and um, of mass production, um, and, and certain notions of, of, of management actually. Um, uh, okay, let's take a step back then, um, because I think whilst I I say it unequivocally supports. You know things like the Occupy, the Occupy movement. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's unequivocally positive that it's happened. Um, so what I'm saying is really, uh, I think about something supplementary rather than something that is necessarily critical of it. I mean, that it, that, um, it's good that it's opened up, um, you know, a space for critique, and it's uh, that, which is um, in excess of um, you know marches or protests. Which are you know uh, are time limited and sort of easily easily contained and um, you know as treated as a kind of background noise really um, and life can easily return to normal. But the, the sheer persistence of occupations um, means that they um, they that they can have a, have a different role I think than that. Um, and as I think um, you know Owen Jones has sort of forcefully argued one of the most powerful things about the Occupy movement is it's, it refocuses. Um, refocuses attention um, that the, uh, the ruling class um, has um, made sort of desperate attempts to blame the, the crisis on um, public spending um, instead of you know what we, what we all know to be the real cause um, which was you know the, 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 the financial system as we all know um, and, and, and occupy as as, as um, you know, by publicly reiterating what we all what we all know, um, then that has a kind of ritualistic power in itself against the kind of I mean, I mean the fact that we're told things that we don't believe, um, repeatedly told things that we don't believe. I mean that, that that is what power can do. It can make something the official truth, even though not, nobody actually <coughs> believes it. And you know, it's the, the, the occupy. Um, and, you know, at the very least, has, has cracked that ability to push that um, that, that untruth uh, as the kind of official narrative. Um, but I think my uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't problems with it, um, or that there aren't problems with it if we if if nothing else happens actually. Okay. Um, and I, I think one of the one of the problems with it is it doesn't really break from. You know what I've called capitalist realism. Um, a capitalist realism. Um, well, I, I, I've been interviewed many times about capitalist realism. I'm really no better at defining it than than when I um, I first started sort of thinking about it. Really, but the capitalist realism I think is um, something that is easy to identify, but not it's not so easy to, to, to define. Partly because of its um, its cloud like. Or, or sort of mist-like kind of amorphousness, uh, and, and and also the fact that we're still uh, in, 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 still in a, well, very much I think in, in the middle of it. I mean, the one way of thinking about capitalist realism would be that it was a belief. It was a belief, you know, the belief that capitalism is the only viable system. That everything else it might be nice, but it's unrealistic. Um, it doesn't really work, uh, etc. But another way of thinking about it is that it's a kind of it's, that it's an attitude, um, really, an, an attitude of kind of resignation uh, in response to the above. That um, well, you know, that you know, we we might like things to be different from what they are, but we, we can't really change them. Um, 
that isn't then so much a, a, a judgment about um, how good capitalism is as a system, how effective it is. It's more a judgment about the balance of forces in the world today. That, you know, that, that, the, that the forces are with capital and that really that uh, all we can do is adjust to that um, and sort of adapt to a world sort of completely dominated by capital. Um, but part of the problem of thinking about um, capitalist realism in those terms is that, you know, that they're kind of uh, individual psychological categories. And really, that I think what we're talking about with capitalist realism is, is more than that. It's something that can be uh, extrapolated out, out of um, individual um, psychological um, uh, kind of dispositions. And, and what we're talking about is, is more diffuse, a kind of ideological atmosphere or psychic infrastructure, I think. Um, and you know, involved in that is you know, a number of ideas, um, such as that you know, the state is inefficient and, and oppressive. Um, there's a kind of disdain for planning and top-down organisation. There's nothing worse than a top-down uh, in this kind of um, thinking. Um, and there's also a kind of uh, negative identification of that, uh, uh, or negative connotation of anything to do with the public. That you know, the, 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 the public is, a, is, is thought, thought of as something fusty, archaic, and obsolete. Um, and you know, uh, by comparison with, 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 with anything to do with the state, with planning, um, or the public, you know, the, the private sector clearly then appears as something um, as dynamic, exciting, new. And, um, and, what, and what's involved in this is, is, is uh, a temporality, control of time, um, where uh, the concept of modernization becomes equivalent to the concept of neoliberalization. Um, well, you know, but they, they are practically used anonymously. To modernize means to, precisely to adapt to conditions of kind of dominion of capital. And uh, with the effect that it seems that no other, possi no, that no other modernity is possible. Um, which I think takes us back to this, um, this, uh, this kind of Louise Mensch um, kind of uh, symptomatic attitude. That uh, any kind of resistance to capital, uh, any kind of uh, alternative to capitalism, would be one that would uh, essentially be going backwards in time, uh, and, and sometimes very far back in time, to, to uh, you know, to, um, uh, to primitive conditions almost. Um, that, uh, uh, well, well, that's partly what I mean by the extent to which, at least at a implicit level, uh, at the level of political aesthetics, um, the, the Occupy movement in danger of supporting this idea that, um, that there's, there's nothing in the future um, for um, there's nothing that, that, there's nothing in the future except capital. That really, capital has the control of, of modernity and everything that, that, will, that will come after that. And all we can do is wind back in time. Um, and you know, I think it's it, it's very important that um, that we have a counter argument to that. Then, really. um, in addition to these kind of beliefs, attitudes, um, psychic infrastructure, I mean, what we're also talking about desire here. Um, and 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 um, you know questions of, of libido, and um, you know it's very significant that she talks about um, the iPhone, of course. Um, people might remember the, the famous uh, Apple advert from 1984, um, you know, very much playing on the year uh, um, of, of, of in which it came out, um, with you know, Apple computers as, as associated with. A, a, a kind of breakthrough of a kind of individuality as opposed to the kind of totalitarian monoliths, um, a kind of totalitarian monolithic culture. And, you know, something like the iPhone, of course, now, it, you know, is very much a, an, an emblem of this idea of, um, uh, of, of capital as the deliverer of modernity and also as um, the, the, the um, liberator of desire. But, um, and, you know, this is, this is what is... Um, also behind Mensch's claim, isn't it? That really uh, um, capital uh, has a monopoly on desire in lots of ways. That uh, what, what, what is offered by um, uh, anti-capitalism, well, only a kind of staunching of desire, a blocking of desire. Uh, you know, and, uh, and what she's also saying is, you know, that's why it's not realistic. That's not why it's realistic. Because even these people who, um, who claim they're opposed to capitalism, the desire for the the desire the desires which ca only capital only capital can engage with um, 
are too strong for that. You know, after you know, after a while, after a few hours or days of being in, in, in their tents, they have to go into Starbucks um, <coughs> to um, you know uh, imbibe the wonders of capital. Um, you know, and even you know, even when they're in the tents, they're on their iPhones, um, which shows that the, that the power of these these desires, uh, which will erupt everywhere. Um, so, I, so I think this this question also about um, desire and post capitalism is is crucial. The idea that um, we really have to break down this idea that that um, that there is this that the necessary. Uh, um, uh, equivalents of, of desire and capitalism, that only capitalism can kind of be libidinal. Um, I think it's a little parable of all this. Um, I don't know if you've seen um, uh, Steven Spielberg's film, The Terminal. Um, it's a film I have to think about because I spent quite a lot of time in airports now. It's not a very good film, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's quite an inter interesting symptomatic film. You know, in, in the film, as you, you, if you've seen it, you may know um, Tom Hanks um, is uh, playing someone from a sort of uh, fictional East European country, um, and while he's uh, while his, uh, his plane is um, flying over to um, to uh, New York, this country uh, <laughs> seems to happen really quickly. Uh, the, the country is engaged in some uh, some sort of uh, civil war. It collapses. He loses his kind of um, it loses his kind of citizenship, and so he, he has to stay in JFK Airport uh, in, for in the terminal period. Um, as an example of the sort of capitalist realism on lots of levels that you couldn't do better than the, the terminal. And um, in partly in the sense that what um, what makes the, uh, what it signifies of realism in, in the terminal. Signifies of realism in the terminal are um, franchise franchise chain stores. Um, you know the names of um, of, of kind of um, corporate logos, sigils of, of kind of corporate power. Uh, what's interesting about that is it's actually not realistic. If you've been to JFK, uh, it looks like a kind of shoddy sort of uh, shoddy sort of Soviet airport almost. There's hardly, there's hardly any there's hardly any kind of uh, there's, there's hardly any kind of franchise stores there actually. But but it's interesting that in order to make it seem like a realistic airport, that well they had to build another airport. Um, they had to build an airport on a lot. Um, full of kind of um, with a full of co corporate kind of um, signs, etc. Of course, what um, what is interesting about the, the film is the underlying fantasy. The fantasy is that uh, you know, if only Hanks could get out of the airport, that he, that he could get to um, he could get to a place uh, that was different from the airport. You know, uh, he could, oh, if only he could get to uh, if only he could get to um, to the real America. Well, as if the real, as if the real America was going to be anything different. From this completely corporate dominated environment. I mean, as a word, that, that, you know, Hanks is already in the middle of the, the reality of capitalism. And, you know, he's right in the middle of it because he's a, he's a kind of precarious worker. He has to pick up, pick up bits and scraps of work around the airport on a very temporary and casual basis um, with no sense of um, security um, or permanence. Um, right, he's right, he's already being in the airport, he couldn't be more in the center of kind of. Um, uh, like capitalism, there's no there's no need to go anywhere else, and actually there's nowhere else to go anyway. Um, so I think um, part of a, a, the, the response to this kind of um, Louis Louis Mensch type um, aggressive capitalist realism, you know, there's, there's no alternative that even they want it. I mean, so part of the response to that um, is to dystopianize now, actually. To, to, to realize the extent to which um, we're already living in the middle of a, a kind of, um, even before the, the, the capitalism uh, collapses even further than it, than, it's, um, than, it, than it is now, and it surely is going to collapse, it uh, <coughs> levels down, um, and who knows where that will end up. But even before all that, that we live in this kind of, that we're already living in a, in a, in a kind of dystopia. Um, a dystopia in which, you know, far from, um, as it were, liberating desire, Things like iPhones um, play a major part in um, in um, tethering us. That you know uh, that objects like iPhones, smartphones, Blackberries are not simply there as um, uh, consumer objects to be enjoyed. Um, I mean, I, I guess um, what's interesting actually about um, 
iPhone just a, a similar kind of thing came up with the riots in um, in the summer when, where um, reactionaries were arguing that these people can't be poor. The rioters can't be poor because they've got blackberries. You know, they've got blackberries. That means they're not poor. Um, well, I mean, it's as if as if somehow that um, smartphones were um, luxury items. Um, that, I mean, smartphones simply are not luxury items anymore. They are the means of um, connection to um, community capitalism. They're the means of um, uh, they're, they're no more luxury item uh, for us than lathes were in a sort of day, the, the, the day of the, the high day of kind of industrial capitalism. But, you know, they are the means by which um, capital can um, connect with us. That, that, that connect that you know that uh, precarious work, etc., um, cannot be done unless we have things like mobile phones, where we're, where we're contactable at any, at any moment. And then and the dystopian dimension of this. Um, I think, you know, but we need to just take a step back from where we are um, and maybe look at things um, just as a, um, a just as an instructive um, just, for purpose, just for instructive purposes, not because we should be nostalgic but, you know, think about how even how different things were even ten years ago um, you know, if you go into the centre of London now um, it does look like you're in a fairly cheap um, B movie science fiction film, in which everyone's hypnotised by screens. You know, they, they, they could have, you could have. There were sort of, you know, Doctor Who stories like this. Uh, you know, and they come. Oh yeah, this kind of. Uh, uh, it's not really plausible. But now we're in the middle of it. You know, that, that you were looking. You were looking at people who were, um, you know, entirely entranced by the by screens. And it's not like I'm saying this like uh, I'm uh, I'm immune to this at all. Like, uh, of course not. Like uh, you know, it's it's practically a requirement that we be plugged into um, plugged into this um, cyberspace architecture at all times. Um, but th th this is this is not simply a matter of, uh, of enjoyment desire. It's 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 the fusion really of uh, the, the demands of work with libido that that makes this network so pernicious. That that, that that's why it's so difficult to unplug from. Um, from the sorts of uh, networks of communicative capitalism, um, because uh, because the, the the smartphone is both an object of enjoyment and both the means and the means by which uh, the demands are placed on us by work. Um, that it, uh, that's part of the the, the the reason for its its power over us actually. Um, and surely, what would be involved then in um, In thinking about you know what post-capitalism might be like, it's not then at the idea of okay, let's throw throw smartphones away. Let's go back to face-to-face -face interaction. Let's go back to living in villages, um, you know, where we that we, we don't have the internet, etc. It's it's more about thinking not about the the, the technology per se, but the, the kind of um, the the social relations, the the, the different patterns of work, um, etc. That um, might surround these technologies. The ways in which um, these technologies could function differently in um, in different kind of social political contexts. Um, so I think we we don't want we, we really have to think um, very clearly then about how we're going to articulate alternatives to capitalism that are not involving this, any kind of model of retreat, retreat into a, um, a prelapsarian past, um, and a, a rejection of technology, a rejection of the achievements of, of modernity. Um, and I think one, one way of, uh, of tackling the sort of, uh, the kind of uh, position presented by men um, which I say, as I say, it's not um, like it's something she's just cooked up, cooked up, or it's just some silly error of her part. I think she, she it's, the critique is symptomatic. Um, one, um, one way of, of doing that is, is really to, um, instead of thinking that well, capital uh, is now satisfying that, that these... Uh, that capital is satisfying the desires which it, um, which it gives rise to, is to say the opposite, actually. 
that um, capitals are everywhere thwarting, thwarting desires and um, not meeting them. And that actually, um, the post-capitalist world is, 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 the, is, is the world where, um, where desires can actually be satisfied um, more um, radically. Um, so let's sort of let's take the bull by the horns and take the actual Starbucks example here. Um, you know, since, as it was, Starbucks seems to be the, the, the very sort of emblem of, um, of capitalist dominion. You know, the, the, the fact that it, that it um, replicates so successfully um, that, um, as Louise Mensch says, even, even anti-capitalists um, uh, go there. Um, well, isn't actually Starbucks, though, a kind of classic case of dialectical ambivalence? Um, <coughs> Dialectical ambivalence, I, I think that, as it were, we should have dialectical ambivalence about Starbucks. And isn't it the case, actually, that the, the, the customers um, of Starbucks, which may include us at some time, also share dialectical ambivalence about it? Um, like many of the most successful features of late capitalism, um, it's, it's, it's really the, often the people who most use these things are also most critical of them. Um, so I think that's the other side of it, actually. The fact that... Um, the fact anti-capitalism, anti-capitalists going to um, uh, Starbucks doesn't undermine their points uh, any more than uh, that the fact that um, people who go to Starbucks sort of hate Starbucks also. Don't um, and okay, so one of the things we can note about Starbucks, isn't it, is the the way in which the criticisms of Starbucks, which as I say, are often made by the people who use Starbucks. Uh, as much as those who don't, uh, uncannily echo the kind of criticisms of state communism. So um, Starbucks is, uh, uh, is generic, it's homogenous, it's standardised, it crushes out individuality. You know, uh, hold on. Now, so so how, how can it, isn't it, isn't it strange that this, this, uh, this emblem of, this emblem of uh, capitalism and freedom suddenly ends up sounding exactly like what people said about um, Stalinism? Um, that, that's, that's, that's kind of peculiar. Um, well, I think we should um, we should be positive about this and say really then that this this shows that the the desire for Starbucks is the thwarted desire for communism. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, I'm not I'm not, I'm not just being uh, facile about it. I mean it in the sense that well, you know what what do people want from Starbucks? Okay, what do people want for it? They, 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 the desire for the, the desire involved in going to Starbucks has nothing to do with coffee. I hope, Jesus, <laughs> that the people don't actually like the coffee. Right? It's nothing to do with uh, uh, Starbucks. Any more to do with the admiration for capital, for the capitalist system, really. And the, the, uh, really, what, you know, as, as, as people have said, the desire for Starbucks is that is fundamentally tied up with the desire for what is called the third place, uh, not work. Um, not home, you know, and what is this space if not the public, a public space actually? And so what, what you get in Starbucks is a degraded form of public space. Um, and, uh, you know, and that, you know, if, if the, you know, the, the success of Starbucks tells us anything then, is that this, the desire for, for uh, public space has not withered away despite <laughs> the intense kind of, um, the intense, uh, Program of kind of PR devitalization aimed at the concept of the public um, under under the period of kind of capitalist realist dominion, really. Um, and so, you know, the question is to really go with this. If people want um, the generic, the, the, the homogenous, and the standardized, you know, can't we imagine uh, much better versions of the generic and the homogenous and standardized than Starbucks provides, actually? And, and shouldn't part of what post capitalism be about is, is the delivering this? And you, know, you can say, look, we can we can get you a much better, uh, much better designed um, space than Starbucks. Um, you know, just uh, you pay a little bit more on your tax. You don't even, you know, you can go in for free. And you don't even have to drink the rubbish coffee either. As it were. Um, and um, I think really that that what we can see in a lot of that kind of um, what we can see is a lot of capital, capitalist infrastructure. Um, is this, is, is this kind of um, thwarted desire um, for communism, for collectivization? I was in the uh, Westfield Shopping Centre the other day, which is um, the, the new shopping centre that's been built uh, for the Olympics. Don't, we won't go to the Olympics either. 
Uh, well, I will go on to the Olympics at length if you want, but it's one of the major causes of uh, misery and rage in Britain at the moment. Uh, but the, uh, but the uh, you know, Westfield Shopping, you just have to flash on Westfield Shopping Centre with, with your dystopian post capitalist eye. And you can you see it looks like, um, it just looks like the most uh, dismal form of kind of bad collectivism. It looks like a really bad kibbutz. This, 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 at least kind of cavernous hangars where people were required to sort of eat together. Um, you know, and this is supposed to be a place of uh, intense enjoyment and, and kind of um, um, capitalist um, self-fulfillment. It just looks like some collective eating hall. Um, and if people want that, let's just to give them that in a better form, actually. Um, but, and what, what, I'm, um, what I think is, is sort of crucial then um, in overcoming... Um, Elements of capitalist realism is really a, a return to um, some concepts that um, you know that were used um, in a, disdainfully originally, such as designer socialism. You know, designer socialism was a term that was used to you know um, uh, ridicule people. Really, the idea that um, again, I think was the, the, the same kind of um, thinking as but, but behind Mensch's kind of dismissal, but. Um, are there these socialists who into into kind of design, etc. And um, but why shouldn't why shouldn't uh, why shouldn't socialists be into design? And actually, in the, well, couldn't one say couldn't one say very clearly that at the time of defeat of the, 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 of the left is very much um, tie, um, tied up with that kind of the, the, the disassociation of of uh, of leftism from good design. That you know the idea that. Um, that, that Again, the, the, the capital is some, the, the word designer is synonymous with um, the, with, with, with capitalism. You know, this this is the, 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 a lot of the origins of the, of the problems of the left um, lie in this um, this this kind of equivocation here. Um, and another one, radical chic. Um, the, again, a, a notion that was originally kind of satirical, um, but. You know the, 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 the association of the fashionable with you know, the, the fashionable with 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 the left, etc. What is the problem here? You know, I, I, I do think we have to. I, I do think, on the contrary, this being a problem, this is something we we need to cultivate. Um, but um, you know, we need to compete on the sort of libidinal terrain of modernity. To compete, not to not adapt to it, but to change it. Um, and you know, offering people a choice between you know either if you're saying to them. Well, look, you can either have your supermarkets and your iPhones, or you can come and uh, come and tents with us. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's offering a, a sort of bad choice, really, and that and it's a choice that, that, that no one should be required to make, actually. Um, but I mean, I think what's what's crucial here is that um, we need. Um, if we want, um, uh, if, we, if we want this kind of post-capitalist conception of, of, of the public, I think we then need, need a new concept of the public, um, where the public is not simply uh, thought of as equivalent to the state. Um, now, I'm not there, I'm not there saying uh, that the state should play no role in the public, um, the generation of the public. Um, because I think part of the problem with uh, some of the neo-anarchist currents that are um, <laughs> circulating around um, um, the Occupy movement is there is a slide from anti-statism into um, anti-politics altogether, um, where you know an opposition to um, to the state becomes uh, very quickly becomes a sort of recommendation um, to re retreat from kind of uh, any kind of uh, model of systemic change, um, and, and I think that itself is, is a symptom of capitalist realism, as it were. The, the, the idea that I mean, direct action, I think, doesn't come out of, uh, a, in most cases, doesn't come out of a feeling of empowerment, but a feeling of disempowerment. Actually, um, the, the the sense that um, well, we, we have to do something ourselves now, uh, immediately. Uh, comes out of a feeling that we, there's no possibility for us to change things um, in, in an indirect but sort of more long-term and systemic way. Um, and um, 
you know, the question of the state um, won't go away. Um, that it's not as if, you know, if, if we retreat from the state, that the state then will sort of just, just wither away. Quite clearly, um, neoliberalism that then requires the state in order to operate, um, and, you know, it, it's quite happy with us to, um, to back away and say, well, you can have the state. Um, which isn't to say that those kind of old um, 20th century models of, you know, taking over the state um, are quite adequate now. Um, but it's, it's to say that, you know, the state, you know, continues to be a powerful actor um, and must be part of any kind of, um, any political program that actually wants to change things in any, in any sustainable and long-term way. must have some kind of relationship to the state. Um, but equally, that's you know the the public is not the, the, the public is not the same as the state, um, and we, you know we need to um, have a sort of modernised concept of the public, um, and indeed argue that really the concept of the public is in a in a way synonymous with with modernity. That I think we need to probably have to battle over. The, the question of, of, of temporality and, and defeat neoliberal temporality. As I was saying, neoliberal temporality, the argument is history goes in one direction, capitals, um, and you know, that en inevitably ends up in um, privatisation, etc., as, uh, um, as the end stage. Um, well, I think we need to, uh, a, a kind of different model. Um, and that return to this concept of enlightenment and progress, actually. And the idea that really that, uh, that the, the achievement of a public sphere was a, well, the, 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 the production of modernity, which has been interrupted um, and um, kind of retarded by this period of kind of neoliberal barbarism, actually. Um, and uh, Dan Hines' work, actually, Dan Hines' book, Returning the Public, um, is very good on um, <coughs> ways of refurbishing the concept of the public. Um, Hind uh, uh, wanting to move uh, beyond kind of uh, this idea of the, the, the state as, as this kind of, um, in this uh, neoliberal caricature really, as being this uh, top-down centralizer. Um, and um, has the idea of um, public commissioning. Um, in terms of um, media and um, funding of science, now I have two examples which he gives. Uh, he says that, um, in a way, the, the, there's a lot of uh, rhetoric of, um, well, there's an enormous amount of rhetoric of participation and involvement in late capitalism. You know, um, corporations also want us to join in, join the debate. Um, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't join any corporate debate with corporations that ask you to um, um, to join in personally. Um, but I mean, I, th I think this in itself is um, is another example of a kind of uh, the thwarted desires, the desires that capitalism um, sort of uh, feeds but can't itself satisfy. And um, you know, the, the, the desire for people to have more control over the, the institutions that um, determine their lives. Um, but you know, this simply obviously cannot be done at the level of kind of consumer incapacity. But um, what and, and what uh, Dan Hine suggests is instead of this model of kind of um, consumerism, um, we can have a model of the public becoming the commissioner of things. So that, uh, for instance, with um, with uh, the media, um, which. Uh, to say the least, is in just a little bit of crisis at the moment in the UK in particular. Um, but with the media, uh, that the, no, there could be a system where the public itself um, could uh, be in control of commissioning uh, investigative journalists. And you sort of costed it out, you know, uh, how, how much it would cost uh, in order to have this system where you have whatever, 200 or so <coughs> investigative journalists who, um, who had to sort of pitch their projects to a uh, committee of the public, and then the public would uh, decide um, who to fund. Um, 
Now, I think what, that one's immediate response to this, or, or, or one, one of the responses one might have to this is, or oh, wouldn't people just fund like stories about celebrities and all of that? Um, well, I know I think that itself is, 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 is uh, you know, a kind of symptom of kind of uh, capitalist realist defeatism that we that uh, actually the, 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 the people uh, when the people in a position of uh, actively being responsible for commissioning something, it's uh, and it's their project uh, and they have a stake in a project. It's very different from when they are consumers, when they can, as it were, disavow the disavow the way in which the thing has been produced. Um, so now, and I, now I think Dan is, Dan Hanley is right to bet on, or sort of wager on the fact that in those conditions where the public could choose what kind of stories were being written, that they would make, you know, that they would make in, in good and informed choices, as it were. And um, and he makes the same kind of argument for um, funding of um, of science, um, because of course at, at the moment what we see both of these things is um, behind an ostensibly egal egalitarian rhetoric. Um, is, uh, is, is the reality of the, the domination of the media by um, uh, the media and um, uh, sort of science uh, research in, in universities, uh, the domination of those things by uh, corporate and media, uh, corporate and military, military interests. Um, and I, I do think um, that media is crucial, as it were. Um, and I think this is one other dimension of this, um, this question of political aesthetics. Um, it, one often hears in um, some of the neo-anarchist kind of um, discourse, a kind of disdain for this mainstream media. Uh, but you know, I think the whole lesson of um, cultural studies really is that there is no such thing as mainstream media uh, as a monolith. That um, the mainstream media is really a terrain that, um, that can be fought over. Um, Oh, and, oh, and uh, certainly in, 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 a, in a sort of modern uh, society uh, like ours, that, that, that uh, the idea of a, a kind of ordinary street life or whatever that is beyond the media um, is, is extremely naive, that the media <coughs> saturates everything, and that just as if we give up on the state, um, if we give up on the state, it, others will control it. And you know, if we give up on mainstream media, um, then you know other forces will continue to control it at the moment. Um, and um, you know, the lesson of if one actually looks at the history of the mainstream media is you know um, is a story of uh, terrain won and terrain lost. Um, and you, you certainly won't win any terrain if you're not fighting for it. Um, and you know, it's part of a, a, a kind of a healthy public sphere must be a, a kind of um, a, a better, a better media. Um, and I think sort of Dan Hines' proposals are sort of one way of of, uh, of achieving that. Um, but my broad point then um, is this question of the of re the public, um, re, uh, re the beatinizing, refurbishing the public. But, um, all of the dark arts of a kind of um, capitalist PR have been used against the concept of the public um, and to disassociate um, the public, any, any notion of the public with notions of um, anything kind of um, desirable. But I think the task now is to um, break out of this, this, this binary and to um, Imagine a two um, fused. Imagine a, a kind of um, a post-capitalist libido um, and a, a public world that was uh, fused with desire. And um, you know, crucially, then this does involve um, this return to um, questions of uh, you know the designer, I think, as, as I'm saying. Um, So the task of reclaiming modernity, I think, then, um, is a task that involves taking on some of the things which are uh, implicitly or explicitly disavowed, I think, by the sort of neo-anarchist currents that, that, are, that surround the Occupy movement. That so does involve um, talking about um, management, planning, bureaucracy, 
and, and actually authority. Um, that's, as we've seen, I mean, as I talk about in my in, in book, Capitalist Realism, that one of the myths of neoliberalism is that bureaucracy was a thing of the past. And what we, what we actually find is that bureaucracy has shifted form. Bureaucracy is, is um, yes, no longer um, associated with a kind of, uh, no longer simply associated with a kind of centralized um, state um, authority, but, but bureaucracy has then instead proliferated into all areas of work um, and, and life. So that um, instead of um, our being subject to bureaucratic judgment from others, we ourselves become the auditors of our own um, life and work. Um, and the question then isn't simply, uh, well, can we, do we imagine a world free of bureaucracy altogether, but it's of what kind of bureaucracy do we need? Um, what kind of bureaucracy, you know, would, be, would we uh, want in a, um, in a world where things worked better? Um, same with the question of management. If, if, if it's, not a, it's not a question of assuming that we can do without management in a kind of modern, complex, um, globalised world, but the issue is not all management has to be managerialism of neoliberalism, a kind of cancer, cancer's uh, kind of metastasizing um, model of, uh, uh, of management, um, which is actually sort of stifles initiative um, and um, becomes self defeating. Um, but also the question of authority, I think, is, is, a, is a kind of a, a crucial one. Um, I think one of the key questions, um, really, to, uh, and the key problems that emerged um, <coughs> with, since the 60s um, was the question of um, what an anti-authoritarian left would look like. Um, and you know, uh, as the... Um, Kind of discontent with Stalinism became generalised. Um, th there was a search for an anti-authoritarian left. Now, the popular story is then that this was uh, this this failed actually. That what happened was when as soon as you uh, moved away from the you know authoritarian structures of uh, of uh, the old Stalinist left, um, as soon as the, the left kind of pluralised um, and, and into different struggles over the sexuality and ethnicity, um, gender, etc., then it no longer had the um, kind of hegemonic force that it, that it was able to command in, in, in its heyday. Um, and uh, <coughs> therefore, in a certain way, um, in, in giving up um, authoritarianism, it sort of gave up any question of, sort of, uh, of power. Um, but I don't think, I think that's a sort of uh, a pessimistic judgment. And that um, really, the, 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 partly how we deal with this uh, is not to walk away from the question of, um, of authority, um, but to um, precisely argue that authority is, authority, uh, proper authority is inherently anti authoritarian. Um, that you know, the way in which um, we achieve a kind of anti-authoritarian politics um, is by constituting authority collectively, not by dispensing with the question of authority altogether. Um, and and it, as we see with many of these um, many of these movements which try and try and avoid the question of authority, um, it's not that it's not that uh, they get rid of authority. Uh, it's that it keeps coming back in different forms. Um, and so but I think central to um, uh, this central to the, the, the next phase of the struggle really is to um, think about uh, collective forms of authority and, um, and how they might be constituted. Okay, I, I think I've said enough. I'll leave it there for the, um, just take it. Take a few questions. Thank you, Mark. So please, questions, comments. Yeah. Do you currently now yeah. this process of 
see a society or a country state something in all the world, not just, not just in Europe, that's maybe most similar to post-capitalism? To your, do you see something which is most similar? No, but I, I, I don't think that means that um, work that that's that things are hopeless. No, 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 Things are in a way, in a way, close to it, but but they're this dystopian version of. Uh, so in a way, the most capitalistic societies have that potential. Uh, have, uh, are in a way the dystopian model of what could be post-capitalism. Well. So uh, so uh, I don't know. That's it's, it's kind of uh, it's difficult that one because. Yeah, because uh, I was wondering because I, today I was. Uh, reading an article and something about our neighbor state Slovenia, they have also elections right. in December and there is some weird stuff going on which we don't actually know that just in a month, in one month there was, there is formed a new party called uh, the Party for Changes and right. they are appealing that the capitalism system has to change. Right. They are the second party already, just in a month, they are a new party and just in a month they get uh, according to Paul's the second party, which will enter the parliament. So that's a little bit interesting. Yeah. But they don't have a real agenda, it's just that they think that uh, people should more enroll in that kind of stuff, more in uh, economics, that they should, the whole uh, nation, they should uh, uh, decide what should they do, in which way, what's the best for them, and that mm. kind of stuff. So, maybe it's some bluff. What? Maybe it's some bluff. A bluff, man. I don't know. I mean, Slovenians have a weird uh, capital hist <laughs> capitalistic history, so maybe it's not. Well, I mean, my general sense is there's a kind of void in mainstream, <coughs> local mainstream politics, really. That, 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 you know, there's a gap, really. So we've got people on the streets, um, and, but we've got uh, complete paralysis at, at the level of, uh, of mainstream politics. Um, and, you know, there doesn't seem to be any way of connecting the two at the moment. Um, but that seems to me the, the, the job, as it were, that, um, and, you know, that might involve, that might involve repopulating existing parties um, or creating new ones. I mean, I think we, we have to be, um, we have to imagine to it at this point because um, everything's up for grabs in a way it just hasn't <coughs> been, certainly for the last for the last 30 years. I mean, the point about, I guess, about capitalist realism is not, is that, in a way it was true, that there's, there's no, there's no realistic um, resistance to, to, to capital possible uh, over the last 30 years. I think it's victory was so overdetermined on so many fronts uh, <coughs> during that period. Um, but now things are just radically open. We just don't know. We just don't, don't, don't know what's going to happen. And quite clearly, politicians have lost a grip. Quite clearly, the, the, the capitalists have lost a grip. Nobody has a grip. You know, um, I'm reminded of that, land, uh, that line from Nick Lander uh, that, um, you know, uh, if, if someone can impersonate a pilot, it will be a comfort to the other passengers. I mean, that is, that's, the situation that, that's the situation that we're in at the moment, isn't it? Quite no one driving, no one... And, and uh, all of the things that uh, were... Um, made neoliberalism powerful, i.e. politicians are a kind of inert, um, unthinking kind of mechanisms just to ensure that the, 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 the flow of capital. Now, you know, now that's completely dysfunctional because you actually need politicians who could, you know, who could um, uh, think and, 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 and think and act um, decisively, and that they're simply plainly not capable of that, nor capable of acts of imagination. Um, and so we're in a, we're in a state of um, total vacuum and, and desert. But um, no, neoliberalism is, is discredited, um, which doesn't mean that it's going gonna to die. Discredited things can, you know, 
took 400 years for the Roman Empire to die. <laughs> you know, whatever. So it, just because it's discredited, you know, um, doesn't mean it'll fall away. But, I mean, it, it does mean that there is this ideological junkyard desert which um, can be repopulated, I think. Mm -hmm. So did, did you want to come in? Well, I had uh, just a few comments. Um, I enjoyed yeah. your talk very much. Um, I don't see lots of talk. Okay. One, yeah. one thing, I mean, I've... I live between London and Zagreb, yeah. so I, I wasn't there for the most recent occupying yeah. I just managed to visit them one, one afternoon, and I had the sense, an uh, incredibly optimistic sense, um, <coughs> that what seemed to be happening was a kind of push towards reformism rather than yes. uh, revolutionary. Um, yeah. And I would just like to get your kind of, your feeling about, because I, I do have a notion that, that there has been a paradigm shift um, in the public sphere. One that might not be the kind of the kind of radical politics that, that many would have hoped for, um, but one that has a very kind of um, a potential for reform. I happened to be there when I think it was George Irvin was doing a lecture on right. um, Plan B for Britain, um, a different kind of economic right. package. And um, the other thing that I don't know whether it's connected or not, but it seems to me that you know. If the mainstream media yeah. um, in the UK and all over Europe now has actually started using the word capitalism, yes, it hadn't. It didn't yes, use right, before. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, right. So it's become a marked noun rather than, a, you know, in, in that sense, I think there's a, there is a crack in the idea of yeah, right. the no, I see. Right, I think that the, the campus readers was most powerful when it's not seen at all. Yeah. And in fact, as soon as it was named, the, the point which it could be named was the point in which it was already weakening. Yeah. Because you know, it ceased to be a natural field of assumptions or a quasi-natural field of assumptions, and became a kind of revealed to be a set of uh, kind of ideological um, impositions, as it were. And 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 that you're right. That's filtering through. In, that's what I mean about there is no such thing as mainstream media in the mm -hmm. sense of something which is absolutely fixed and monolithic in what it's. Um, and what it's doing is really noticeable, actually, after after the Occupy thing in the States, how different the coverage of, of the Occupy thing in, in the UK was. It was, uh, it was a, a residual hegemonic power of the US, really, <coughs> where uh, uh, part of that, I think, if, or if Americans are doing it, it's okay. You know, <laughs> like, like, uh, but you did see, even on things like Murdoch at, um, well, Sky News, um, a, a surprisingly equivocal verging on positive coverage of the, of the Occupy London um, movement. And I, I think if nothing else, in the context of the US, if nothing else, it achieves this kind of hegemonic rebalancing. But, you know, um, the impression you've got with the Tea Party in the US was that all of the kind of extra, um, all, all of the, all of the um, kind of uh, political forces outside of the, the electoral system were right-wing. And, and that obviously pulls them, that, that kind of stabilises a kind of... Um, so-called centre ground, which is massively to the right anyway. And um, whereas I think that um, you know what we're seeing with it, what we're seeing with Occupy is is a kind of focus for um, a kind of a, a, a focus for hegemonic shift. But I think you have to believe in things like hegemony. And you have to believe in things like media in order for that to be important. And what, what I'm saying is um, some of the rhetoric around <coughs> some of the sort of neo-anarchist rhetoric around Occupy. Would disdain both of those things. They don't think that they're important. But you know, what is important is some kind of, you know, face-to-face um, -face localism or whatever. Um, and you know, for me, in spite of all that, it actually is in its in 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 interventions in media terrain. And you know, and the BBC economics editor Paul Mason has referred to Occupy as a brand. You know, and I think that you know, you can imagine many people involved in bristling at that. But I think that is is a mark of its success. And that 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 that, that, is a, that is a highly successful kind of meme that, that can spread even through the hostile terrain of kind of of, of capitalism. Um, sorry, you know. yeah. uh, I just wanted to ask in search of this uh, post-capitalist yeah. uh, paradigm. Yeah. And when somebody asks you if you know of any state yeah. that's similar to it, what yeah. do you compare it to? I mean, those candidate states. Is there anything you can, you know, some some paradigm that basically gives you a matches against which you uh, something like Iceland? Um, I no, no, I, I don't mean a negative yeah. comparison, but actually a positive comparison. 
when you are asked if there is some... Um, what do you mean by positive comparison? Uh, meaning that not a mismatch with capitalism, but an actually positive match with some criteria. Are there any criteria that actually give you uh, some guidelines towards what the post-capitalist uh, system or a reformed capitalist system should be? <coughs> Besides just the things that, you know, the obvious uh, effects of capitalist reality. Okay. Um. <coughs> Well, it, but it would be one in which, you know, on a simple level, capital was subdued, capital was subdued, and capital wasn't dominating dominating the the country. You know, where there was um, where, where, where capitalism wasn't dominating the country, but there was uh, there, there were all the, the all the achievements of technological modernity, um, where there was a, a sort of um, uh, a strong public sphere, um, where people's lives were dominated. Um, by work they didn't want to do, um, where there was um, some kind of um, security, um, but that, that for, um, people were not in conditions of um, constant precariousness, um, where, um, for instance, um, cultural work was um, could be rewarded in an in in adequate way. Um, you know, the, I mean, these are these are some of the features of a, of a what a post-capitalist so society would look like. Uh, capitalist dystopia it sounds like capitalist utopia. Well, why is it capitalist though? Well, because it uh, you know okay maybe that's a good response. No, well, no, no, no. What, what are you saying is what makes capitalism capitalism? Then? But you still retain uh, you know like <laughs> most of those uh, most of those. How do I say fruits of capitalism? You you tend to go after them to still retain them, just flush the capitalism. Well, I, I, well, I don't know what I don't know what's capitalist. That's what I'm trying to say about the whole thing. What is capitalistic about them? I mean, okay, that's I mean, for instance, I mean, what? what the, No, a simple level, simple level cap capitalism means the domination of capital over workers. Um, I mean, so what, what about what I just said involves is capitalist in that sense? You forget to mention the social ownership of the means of production. Okay, okay, that's a kind of given like that, I suppose, in, in the sense that um, it's you know how how do you, how do you, how do we stop capital dominating? Over, it's the preconditions, all of those things, isn't it? That, I mean, how, do, how do we stop um, how do we stop capital dominating all areas of life? How, how do we how do how do we achieve any of those things without some model of um, Public ownership, but which, but I would just want to know there is public ownership. I think rather than mm. this old one of the state running everything, like the state would have to, like I say, the state would have to play some role in it. <coughs> but um, yeah, if I look at that social ownership, then you know, I, I prefer that term to you know, um, you know the state run actually. I don't think it's possible. I mean. I will refer back to Slovenia. <laughs> I know you hate it, but uh, when they started to sell their companies, yeah, uh, be, uh, beginning of the 90s, from yeah. the fall of Yugoslavia, everything was uh, state-owned and everything. They had a really uh, excellent system. Uh, every company and everything was uh, actually given to the citizens. And then they were the owners, and they were uh, selling among themselves shares, and actually... Uh, and that's uh, right. We have ownership, and then we have of shares to workers, which is... Yeah, but well, Slovenia didn't sell to the tycoons. Slovenia didn't sell to tycoons. You have still companies who are actually uh, citizen or state-owned. Uh, they're like, I don't know, health insurance is... Uh, Owned by the citizens. If you have health insurance, then you're you're also an owner. So you will pay money for your shares, and you will get insurance, something like that. But how is that not privatization? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a privatized, but it's a 
share on yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that uh, it's kind of uh, an ironic twist that uh, petty consumerism should become the test of failed anti-capitalist attitude when it's actually the grand consumerism uh, of capitalism that has triggered uh, or the failure of the grand consumerism of the capitalism that has triggered the current crisis that is the housing bubble. So uh, maybe instead of just like thinking in terms of libidinal attachments to uh, mobile phones and coffees, we should start advocating libidinal attachments to housing and work, which yeah. is a definite limit to um, the capacity, the current capacity of global capitalism. And that immediately leads us to the question of how do we provision those kinds of goods to um, to the collective desire for that? No, I, but so I, think, I, think, I mean, if we if we want to twist around things, or uh, or if we want to play with the notion of consumerism, we should advocate that. Just like think big. One, the biggest thing. Not everybody should yeah. have a villa. Please. <laughs> Try to provide that. That's that's no, the public system that we need. No, no, I agree. But I think the point is about that. The point about Starbucks is not about consumerism, though. That it, that it only seems to be about that. That it's actually about desire for a certain kind of space, etc. Which is, and that's. So I don't think it is about petty consumerism at all. But mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you that obviously that is part of the question of libidinizing the public would be uh, countering the. Massive delibidinization of um, social housing, etc. You know that that that, that uh, even though that uh, well, there's a, a massive delibidinization program against social housing, but now, as we were discussing earlier, it costs a quarter of a million pounds to get a flat in a, a former council house block in in London. So that, <laughs> you know, get the worst of all worlds, actually, in, in some ways. But you know, um, yeah, well, that I mean, you know, that that is part of the the. the the project, I think, would be exactly that. But that, um, you know, making um, social housing desirable. And I do do agree about work as well. That um, that uh, you know, a lot of the focus on um, a lot of the focus in um, in late capitalist societies is on the consolations that one gets outside work, given that work itself is accepted as being miserable. Um, and that's part of a kind of uh, privatization of, of, uh, of everyday life. That um, you know, since that, that where we're spending most of our life, uh, in, uh, albeit in, in, in some de debased public form, uh, work is always to some extent public. Um, and you know, that that is that is where we are most miserable. And you know, the consolations for that are to be found in um, in a private space. Um, but instead, uh, I, I, you know, a, a focus, a refocusing on the work I do, and um, which would then uh, refocus people's demands in respect of work. <coughs> the, the reason that people, uh, part of the reason that people accept poor conditions in work uh, is that, um, that 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 isn't where the focus of their lives is, or they don't expect it to be there. So, no, I, I agree on both points, absolutely. I think that maybe the point would be, uh, like a more serious point would yeah. be, how do you create public imaginary and public desire for, um, for transitions that, for instance, David Harvey desires yeah, for yeah. capitalism, like um, uh, give people uh, chance for normal living and, and take care of the environmental impact yeah. and and then you are basically moving toward a transition of capitalism. You need to kind of start from uh, the systematic makeup of capitalism and try to think uh, how do you break up that but rather how do you create pressure on the system to start transforming that direction and then lead it into uh, well, maybe an impasse where it has to change, or rather, where it transforms successfully, or I don't know. No, I agree. It's about creating a public imaginary, but that, that involves competing on these, competing on this terrain of libidinal engineering. I think 
you know, that um, it involves making things desirable. It involves making people think that a public sphere is desirable. Um, not in, not accepting this binary where we're the kind of on the side of kind of dreary ethical worthiness versus, you know, exciting, glossy, glossy capitalism. We have to both say that, 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 that this, you know, this new kind of um, publicly owned culture would be more exciting and desirable. And that, you know, the ostensible gloss and, um, uh, you know, um, <coughs> fizz and effervescence of, of, of capitalism is actually, kind of, is actually miserable. You know, surely both, both at the same time. Maybe. But uh, so maybe I just wanted also to come up to, to David Harvey. It's, um, it's always been struck me, say Harvey is a, so you have a geographer who is yeah. always so attentive about the, also about the spatial uh, emergence of neoliberalisms, which I always call him in plural. But then when he comes to talk about the libido, which has been captured by neoliberalism, he always takes it as a kind of uniform. So it's yeah. interesting, so there is no geography of libido in, in Hari. Yeah. So now I'll come to my point. Yeah. So, but now, so also to your comment, as a kind of comment or provocation for your lecture. So if you look up in the, in, into, in the history of social struggle in, from the 60s in Europe up until now, I could say, okay, you have a kind of story uh, which is kind of anglophone, which is UK-based. But then everything you have told me reminded me everything about like the German or the or, or the French way of the long march through the institution after '68, yeah. and then of course you have the geography of the of the of the socialist states like uh, Central European or Eastern yeah. European. So my question now would be: now everything you have told me or you have told us, how does it differ from the from the uh, from the program of the long march through the institution like? Has been uh, at least uh, imperative for the for the French or the German uh, or for the Benelux or for the uh, Scandinavians intellectuals from the 60s on. How much? Uh, so, does it differ, or is it just you now coming to terms with it? Um. <laughs> it don't. I don't. Well, it might. It might differ. It might not. But I think that. Um, Okay, from from I take from the anglophone <laughs> anglophone perspective, I think the Ang so the anglophone story will be um, okay. So we 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 had the sixties um, that went wrong, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that went wrong, and notably led to rise of neoliberalism, um, and you know the the breakup of the old left, uh, left the ghetto left, no traction whatsoever anymore, and. The only way that was going to end up is something like something like New Labour. So, um, so you're left with a, you're left with an impasse of either. I mean, you know, what is? I mean, capitalist realism is really about New Labour. You could say in a way. I mean, the the, the, the foundations of, of something like New Labour, um, because capitalist realism is meaningless but, uh, as a concept for neoliberals. Obviously, neoliberals are capitalist realists. You know that they. Um, uh, you know that's what they are, that's what they do, and it's really the, the, the interesting thing is about the left succumbing to capitalist realism, as it were. Um, but then I think is that the, the, the issue is challenge of post borderism, um, and as part of this question of the the, uh, the anti authoritarian anti authoritarianism, um, and that's you know not seeing post not seeing post borderism. A is just something negative, um, and, but, but, but uh, on nostalgia for forest conditions, which allowed you know social democracy, etc. Um, uh, and you know, B accepting that, that, that you know, because it was driven by the desires. Post-fordism was partly driven by the desires of workers, so that you know it's, it's workers themselves who didn't want to be trapped into the kind of compact of post-fordism, you know, of fordism, which was. You know, border in exchange for security, you could say. Um, and then, it seems to me that then, then, then the problem is, um, well, once you've got that, once you've got those, once you, once you've got post-fordism, once you've got the d desires of workers for post-fordism, does that automatically mean that things have to end up with, with capitalist realism? Um, so I think then, I think the answer is. 
for that is no, but that does involve, I think, returning to these questions of perhaps long marches of institutions on one level, but returning to um, some of um, some of the um, debates um, of issues raised by the, in Italy, but autonomous in the 70s. Um, also um, returning to a lot of the issues raised by in, in the UK by um, Marxism today, the New Times Project. And the New Times Project, which um, is was historically very interesting in the UK because a lot of the people, some of the people involved in that went on to become the key architects of New Labour. But then um, there's, but there's something else involved there, I think, which was you know, this idea of a, um, a post fordist leftism. Um, so... Um, I, think, I don't I think the answer is sort of yes and no to, 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 to your question in some sense. That um, it probably is a, a case of, yeah, of, of um, accepting those things that you know uh, other parts of the world have accepted before. Um, but, it's, but it's not just a case of it's not just a case of, of return. Though, since the level of intense, um, you know, the the, the intensity of um, of the of late capitalism in, in the UK, I think, just does make make that difference, and that's, and also that you know the decomposition. You're starting from this position of massive decomposition. Now, you're not you're not you're not starting from a position of where there, you know there's existing the existing workers' movement which should um, you know which could take a path or another. You're starting from a massively decomposed position where there is hardly any kind of effective workers' movement at all. Um, so you know, even if even if one is to learn that lesson, it's not the same kind of position that one is learning from. I think that's the, that's the that important that would be one important difference. <coughs> Just um, I, I enjoyed very much your uh, comments on temporality and not in modernity, and maybe uh, to connect a little bit to Peter's question or the kind of. Um, Location of the question, I guess, yeah. in in our geography, so here yeah. in a country that is in a sort of transition, yeah. whatever we're transiting towards, um, I think there's probably quite a few people in this room who uh, remember communism yeah. as it was in Yugoslavia, um, and I think you know the official rhetoric at the time of communism was that uh, this was modern. Yeah. Um, and it was in advance of the West. Yes. Um, but communist realism also produced an official truth and an uh, unofficial truth. So yeah. what people knew was that we were actually backward. Yeah. Or <laughs> what I think the common belief yeah. would have been. So j just as a, you know, as, a, as a kind of addition to this kind of time yeah. uh, traveling games, um, <coughs> if, if Croatia and most of the Eastern Bloc countries are now in this kind of void of a transition towards something that's falling apart. Yes. Um, <laughs> this, in a way, you know, might have been articulated in the past as a lack, a kind of a, yeah. a lack of being, um, you know, a belatedness of some kind. Yes. But in a way, this offers an opportunity to kind of hopscotch um, beyond the, 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 if you like, the, the kind of. Um, the, the appropriation of modernity by neoliberalism, I think, can be right. completely, possibly, um, what's the word? Circumvented. Circumvented, yeah. Yeah, quite, yeah. I'm, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, what do you mean by saying that communism was a capitalism? Uh, so it was the official rhetoric of communism was that it was a ideology that was more advanced than capitalism. Official rhetoric. Because technologically, of course, it wasn't. And, uh, yeah, well, I was saying there was a distinction between the official and the actual. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, it seems to me all the talks. Uh, but we have people who are waiting for just you know, for questions, so maybe it's. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. We'll give a chance to everyone. Uh, well, yeah, uh, to, to come back to this question of what cultural production in Yugoslavia. Because I think we have to think of, of uh, uh, historical terms of different, uh, of, well, different times of, of industrial and uh, cultural progress in Yugoslavia. Yeah. And probably at some point, 
things were more uh, advanced than in some parts of the West, and in some point they were yeah. a bit less advanced. Uh, but but we have to think of this in terms of, of, of specific economic relations between Yugoslavia and the rest of the world at, at a certain stage of its development or its dissolution. Uh, uh, but I, what I what I wanted to ask you is what, what it's specifically uh, uh, important for me in your speech is uh, uh, how well. How do we how do we uh, uh, grasp uh, this uh, some as something as well uh, uh, unegalitarian as desire in a, a collectively egalitarian <coughs> and universalizing way? But why but why is why is desire an egalitarian? Then? Well, is it? I mean, desire. If you, I mean, in in a, in a like in a some specific psychoanalytical. Uh, tradition, desire is something that is inherently an egalitarian. It's not egalitarian in itself. There is nothing egalitarian in desire. It's always uh, something that produces a sort of uh, uh, antagonism towards. I mean, it, it's something that that is. It's ma it's never. Uh, 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 um, it's 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 direct product is never something uh, 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 that equalizes things, right? It's, it produces some some sort of. Uh, uh, Difference and some sort of antagonism. It's well, I mean, I, but, I, but I think that if you it's kind of if to take that line, it's really dangerous. I think. I mean, it, it, I mean, in a sense, you're back to um, back to Freud with Freud's <laughs> comments on um, communism in civilization and discontent when he says it's kind of that's his argument against it. Actually, isn't it? That in a way, well. You know, uh, questions of uh, libido and etc. will never be resolved on this level of, um, but always as a disrupt. You know, um, any possibility of kind of um, <sighs> achieving this kind of uh, politically egalitarian goals. But I mean, I, th I just think that is is conservative. Though. You know, I just think I think it is, is a conservative model of of, of, of desire in a way. And, and, um, and I, and I think that you know the, the significance of, of, of um, the, the importance now of, of th looking at things like um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, I think, for instance, is 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 that they can you know they, they pose this question, um, they pose the question of the relationship between the two. And I think that if we, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you know, the tendency has been to, to, to think of them as as, as kind of post-Marxist or um, um, post-communist or whatever, um, and you know, so that leads to Dmitry Zek's idea that you, that it's you know Deleuze is the ideologist of like capitalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but I think that's only but because of uh, that's only because of his, his underlying kind of uh, comedy Stalinism, actually, which is you know that, that, that's, that it, it, was, it would be good if the sixties hadn't happened at all. It'd be good if you know it'd be good if you could get rid of whole, all these questions about desire. And you know, um, but you know, but you, but you can't. And I don't, I don't think. And I, you know, so I think that it has to be um, seriously um, confronted. Otherwise, I, I think we are just fed, we are just feeding into capitalist realism because you, what are you saying? You're going to extinguish desire, and and that your your political project would have involved extinguishing desire. That is what people like. That's what Louise Mensch thinks, isn't it? But you know that that. Um, only capitalism can, can liberate desire. Then, um, and I, I just think we have to think about ways in which actually desire is, is always, in some sense, collectively constituted. Um, and um, what, isn't it true that, as, um, uh, uh, you know, Frederick Jameson says, we've never been in a world that's more collective than this one. We've never, you know, our, our world has never uh, every, everything that we have. Is, is, is the product of, of, of so many hands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yet, you know, that, this, the, 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 you know, the desire and the collective and collectivity are not necessarily opposed to one. I think there's another question, which is about, um, I think, the, the, the deeper question, which is um, well, not necessarily deeper than yours, but uh, <laughs> alongside, <laughs> but um, uh, which is it is about, um, you know, the relation of death right, the relation of. Um, as a desire for security, with 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 the question of the death drive, as it were, because I think that again, I think a little, a little, part of the problem of the um, of this uh, 
there's some implicit political aesthetics around kind of agrarianism, organicism, um, uh, you know, um, anarcho primitivism, etc. An underlying fantasy of that is a, a, a world without death drive, a world, a world of equilibrium, kind of stasis, etc. Um, but you know, a world, in effect, where you know um, desire had been extinguished. But I, I, you know, I think that is. It, it's both, it's both impossible and, you know, it's, it's defeatist in a way to want to, to aim for that. And so, the, for me, the, the question is, how do we, how do we reconcile um, the, you know, the, 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 the dynamism of the death drive, actually, with, the, with questions about um, security and justice? Um, but I, I, I think to, to think that they are, in, to think that they're inherit, inherently antithetical, I think uh, will only feed the idea that capitalism is the only possible way, because then capitalism, because capitalism is then based on uh, precisely that idea. But um, well, you know that um, you, you can't get rid of desire, but de desire is inegalitarian, and um, you know that we this is the best system for managing that inegalitarianism, as it were. Well. Cool. Yeah. My, my question, maybe I don't formulate my question very well, okay. now. But what I was trying to really say, I think I think your tackling of the question of desire is very productive. Because uh, uh, yeah. it, it, ta it takes uh, a, a very strong opposition towards, on the one side, uh, maybe a very conservative Freudian and Lacanian uh, 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 theory of desire, where desire is something that really is in, in an egalitarian okay. and can okay. uh, only e ever fail. Yeah. And on the other side, uh, 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 some sort of an uh, obscurantist, Reichian uh, 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 theory of uh, freeing our libidinal okay. energy, okay. Or freeing our desire, yeah. which, ne which always inevitably fails fails because desire right. is inegalitarian in a way, in a way. I mean, because right. it shows that desire is inegalitarian. But I think what, uh, what is interesting to me in your project is really this, this uh, 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 if I understand it well, correctly, yeah. this point where you try to think of uh, collectively uh, uh, controlling desire in an egalitarian and a very universalizing or, or universalist way of trying yes. to, to produce, to, to, uh, 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 Develop a universalizing uh, uh, egalitarian project on, <coughs> that also has its its own. Uh, yeah, I agree. Material I mean, yeah. Design okay, good. That's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So that, I mean, another example then I think is like Disneyland. This is this is the classic one of um, like you know like why why would you go to Disney? Disneyland is a totally managed environment, right? You know, so you it's a weird, this weird phenomenon of you pay to go to you pay to go to something which is. Uh, all of the features of which are utterly sustained by uh, um, the capitalist ideology around it. Do you know what I mean? So, the, the, what is what is you know why is it really desirable for children? Because you know, um, but it, the, the, it has all it is a totally managed and um, sort of planned uh, planned place. You know what I mean? It's I think it's an example of uh, again a degraded example perhaps but it's also of the way in which it's covered. Sort of, you know? Sorry, it's, it is planned, but it's also a place you discover it. I mean, you know, if you don't plan. <laughs> yeah, like in nature. But it's, but it's just an example, albeit the degraded one, of the way in which you know desire and, uh, and planning, and management, etc., are. You well, mentioned sort of one a dark of those, side of capitalism, and it's being manipulated to keep certain people at the place of power and control. But I think the <coughs> thing is that uh, that kind of control has to be dropped in order to produce uh, this kind of system that you. Why? And also this uh, wasteland. Where everything is perhaps uh, sort of a primordial soup of uh, combining all of uh, humans on Earth consciousness through you know internet and communication okay. into uh, something that's uh, well, just like I <laughs> sort of lost my uh, okay, way of thought. Uh, but just we have to perhaps uh, it's something we have to discover and uh, see in the process what will happen and leave certain things uh, structured but sort of also certain things uh, free for you know uh, interactive evolution yeah in like in in a society like uh, yeah. No, 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 I agree. So, so it's, it's a question. hard for me to. You know, yeah, it's, totally. a, it's a question of, you know, um, since, since, you, since 
so we know nobody now wants to go back to uh, fantasy and totally planned society. You know, it's. But I, I think I, like um, Jameson's really good on this. That um, you know uh, the <coughs> dialectical inversions, the way in which you know we've got a society where, uh, where diversity, choice, etc., are um, um, mass massively emphasised. Yet culture has never been more homogenous in in like the US and the UK. Um, and so you know to, to flip that around, it's um, so what what are the what are the kind of uh, Standard. What sort of levels of standardisation, security, etc. would we need, in actually, um, in order to produce diversity and, and novelty? I mean, because we we we, we have the rhetoric of diversity and novelty in um, in late capitalism, but the reality of a, a massively st stalled inertial, repetitious, and ret retrospective culture actually. And and, and and I think that's there's no act that, there's there's no act that, that that is related to. Um, uh, you know the um, the removal of um, social democratic security. I think. Um, so yeah, there's there's no there's no um, there's no inherent opposition between kind of uh, hate the word creativity um, because of uh, it's just uh, <laughs> the creative industries in the UK. But, but there's no there's no um, there's no inherent opposition between. Creativity and standardisation. That you know, that's standardisation, um, certain kinds of bureaucracy, etc., can be can be precisely preconditions for for creativity. Um, and when, uh, we've, uh, we've definitely seen the opposite. As we've definitely seen the opposite um, in in the UK, which is a kind of lab, um, neoliberal experimental lab, I think, for um, uh, you know how far things can go um, in, um, in in terms of. Um, Really removing, kind of uh, removing almost any space that, that um, outside um, outside work and convalescence. I mean, that that really is what that that, that is what you, the UK is, is is reduced to now. That um, you know part of the reason why the um, UK culture is so so moribund, so moribund is uh, simple things like this question of housing. Um, that Tom raised is really, it's really, in a way, the, the overriding factor. If you want to look at one reason why um, UK culture has become progressively more conservative, um, retrospective, um, it, it could simply look at the rise of the, the rise of, uh, of, of property in, in a cultural hub like London. So you know, if if you want to live in London, um, you you know you have to spend so much time working, but you just don't have any any energy of uh, time for reflection or um, for to kind of absorb absorb to absorb yourself um, in projects. I mean th this is this is the key feature I think of um, uh, kind of cyberspatial um, communicative capitalism is that the, the um, as, as Frank Oberardi puts it, what you have is from the point of view of capital is this kind of as it were smooth flows, but from the point of view of workers, uh, time is cut up. Time is cut up into these micro fragments. And you you have this kind of um, uh, attentional um, dispersal at all times that you know you can't you, you can't get absorbed in anything because you you know you have to be checking what messages have come in you know the one hand is, is always on your smartphone whatever you're trying to, to, to concentrate in terms of like conditions of production of art or whatever in, a, in the broadest sense of art or um, art or culture this is very bad isn't it that you, you know that the, the art requires um, absorption and you know con these conditions um, m massively militate against a, a, any kind of absorption actually um, and you know it's a systemic uh, attack on the space outside um, business and work and that's the real um, uh, significance of the the, the uh, attack on um, funding for higher education etc that you know um, all of the spaces where um, um, counterculture could be built in the UK have been, you know, have uh, have been systematically attacked. So you know, the spaces for um, spaces outside um, work, um, where, where where you could where you could, <coughs> where you could drift and become absorbed, N no one has any time for that. Anymore. Um, and you know, that that's because that you know that, that those conditions of kind of Standardisation and security are removed. 
No, you don't have three years uh, at university where you can um, be out of this time of fake urgencies. Capitalism, in late capitalism, is always imposing these, these fake urgencies. This, this, the significance of which is just to enslave you into this constantly, um, uh, this constant short-term t- temporality, um, which you know, which disables um, capacity for agency and, um, and, and, and kind of critical thought. I think. Um, sorry, it's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can end here. Um, I think we are. It's a very interesting discussion. Almost two hours here, so I think it's. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>